of the seminar series of Quantum in Spain together with Talent Q. So we are very happy to welcome today Paul Forn, who has uh, <clears throat> been so gentle to make a gap in his very packed agenda um, to give us this, this talk. Um, so Paul Forn is the group leader of the Quantum Tech Group in uh, at IFAE, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, and he's co-founder uh, of Kilimanjaro, together to chief technical officer uh, in this company. So you can imagine these big words mean he's, he's very busy. So uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, he's going to give us a, a seminar on uh, analog and digital superconducting quantum processors. Please, the, flo the floor is yours. Thank you, Javier, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I mean, I'm busy, but I always uh, find room for disseminating uh, the activities we do here in Barcelona. And so I'll be happy today to give you a, a bit of an overview on, on our gen general developments in the field, but our particular ones on uh, superconducting uh, quantum processors. So as, as presented, I'm, I'm a main researcher in the Quantum Computing Technology Lab, INIFI in Barcelona. And I'm also one of the co-founders of Kilimanjaro and currently I'm the, the CTO of the company. Okay, so today uh, what, what I have uh, plans to, to tell you is, uh, first of all, give you a bit of an overview because I think most of you know quantum computing, but in reality, you know digital quantum computing and not so much about analog quantum computing. So I wanted to address uh, direct your attention to that. And then I will jump into the description of um, general description of superconducting quantum circuits. So this is going to be a bit basic for those of you who already have some knowledge in that in that field. And um, and I will tell uh, our particular developments uh, on uh, especially on analog uh, quantum processors. And finally, I will say a few words uh, regarding the the quantum processor that we are running uh, in Barcelona, which is the first one in Spain. Uh, within the context of Quantum Spain, um, the first quantum processing unit. All right, so let's get into the subject. So digital quantum computing um, is the most popular form of quantum computation known today. Um, I'm not a theorist, so uh, I tend to be uh, very, uh, to have a cartoon picture in my head about what, what digital quantum computing is. So in a, in a, if you have a universal quantum computer, um, you want to collect a bunch of qubits in this computer, have them interact, and, uh, and initialize them in a state uh, controllably. And then you let them evolve through some process, some unitary process that is described by this, this big box. That is your quantum computer that uh, finally brings the system into a final quantum state. And this is the solution to your problem. Um, because these big box would encode like many body interactions. Um, the pragmatic uh, way to implement this, this operation is to chop it down into bits, into discrete steps of, uh, of individual qubits, so single qubit operations and two qubit operations. So this is, this is a, a universal recipe for any quantum algorithm. And, uh, and then uh, of course you also need to do a uh, measurement of, of each of the of the qubits. So this is the standard uh, quantum computation that we all know. Um, and then yeah, you can process uh, all the states in parallel. So um, it's, it is universal. So any quantum algorithm can fit, but uh, requires quantum error correction. Because if you have an, an error in any of these qubits, so uh, for instance, one of the middle qubits uh, flips the state, this will, in this particular example I'm showing here, it will impact at least two of the of the qubits. So the result will be not a bit wrong; it will be completely wrong. So then, uh, without correcting errors, the digital approach, uh, as far as we know, it is unreliable. There is a lot of effort in the field to try to come up with schemes that are somewhat resilient to these errors without error correction. But so far, this has not been proven to lead to a practical practical advantage. Um, so how about uh, the analog analog process? So in digital uh, quantum computation, you evolve the quantum state. And the final quantum state, in fact, is an excited state of a system. It's a superposition of excited states 
in your system, highly entangled state. So now comes the approach, the analog approach. Here, what you actually do is you don't touch the state. Um, what you evolve is the Hamiltonian of the system. Um, that means you start, and here I'm using the cartoon of, of spins. This is the, um, uh, the, the paradigmatic uh, example in which you have a collection of spin, spin one half particles that initially um, they're somewhat uh, insensitive to each other. And then you prepare this uh, as your initial state. Then slowly you evolve your Hamiltonian in which you start to enable the interactions between qubits. So at the end of your evolution, you end up in a different state. And this state uh, could be, um, I mean, in the, in the usual form is actually the same state as in the beginning. So if you start in the ground state, you will end up in the ground state of the system. But in general, it's not necessarily the, the, the ground state, but in the most known form it is. So it's, it's a new state. Um, so this approach, this analog approach was already shown a few years back that is equivalent to the standard uh, quantum computation. Um, it, it needs a few more ingredients that I have not mentioned and I don't want to go into the detail because it's a bit technical um, on, the, on the theoretical side, but basically uh, the same kind of algorithms that have been discovered for um, digital quantum computers, they can be implemented in the analog uh, fashion. Uh, so, but in, in practice, uh, how do these analog quantum protocols are in, uh, implemented? So one, one um, the, the most uh, common approach is the adiabatic evolution. Uh, so following the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics, if you, if you start your Hamiltonian in a given, um, uh, let's say in a given state, and then you evolve this Hamiltonian slowly enough the state of the system will remain in the same um, eigenstate of the of the new Hamiltonian. Um, so, for instance, in this is the simplest uh, the simplest case. If you follow a linear interpolation like this one here, where you have some initial Hamiltonian, sometimes known as the driving Hamiltonian, um, and then at the end of your period, you want to end up in a problem Hamiltonian. So, this you would just simply and um, just that we're quoting, simply evolve the two Hamiltonians in a, in a linear way. Uh, and uh, this may be for, uh, I mean, this is the case of, um, uh, if this would encode a specific problem, you could encode um, multiple problems together in a, in a total Hamiltonian. Um, but in general, this uh, evolution may not be linear. In fact, it, it, was, it was already shown in uh, more than 20 years ago that the Grover's algorithm can be implemented in this way, but then these, these coefficients are actually nonlinear. Um, and then you get the same scaling as in, as in the digital uh, quantum gates. So for, for, for a more in-depth introduction to this field, I strongly recommend the, the initial works by Ed Fari, uh, who, who was the, one of the pioneers. Um, but this description that I've given you is, is basically for closed systems. So there is no, um, no dissipation, no finite temperatures. So in the real world, all of this has to be taken into account. And uh, the open system systems framework sometimes is, is known as quantum annealing, which is maybe more familiar to you. So why do you care about these quantum annealers, which are actually um, noisy systems? In fact, they are not error corrected systems, but it turns out that they can encode uh, interesting problems and uh, useful problems. Um, mo mostly from optimization. So that impacts traffic, navigation, scheduling, machine learning, and a variety of many other problems that, um, that you can imagine that are uh, real world problems and they are very practical. And so therefore this raises a lot of, of interest. But not only you can do uh, uh, optimization type of problems, you can actually also use these annealers as a quantum simulator, as an analog quantum simulator in which um, the, your, your final state of, of your Hamiltonian may actually be encoding. So you may want to encode some molecule that you actually can program by tuning the interactions between, between your qubits so that your Hamiltonian actually mimics exactly the, mo the molecule Hamiltonian. And therefore you can explore all the, um, the energies of the system by uh, driving your Hamiltonian from, so driving your system from the initial state into some final state that may not be the ground state. And then you actually explore the different um, uh, properties of, of this molecule. And this goes along the lines of Feynman's uh, initial work on, on, on quantum simulation. Um, 
but as I as I said, this this requires um, uh, going beyond the standard uh, concept of quantum annealers. And uh, for instance, you would require interactions between qubits that go beyond the Ising model, which is so far the archetypal type of model that is used in quantum annealing. And these properties, uh, we uh, ourselves we use the the concept of coherent quantum annealer as, as something different that allows you to to do, among other things, this kind of uh, quantum simulations, and I stress without error correction, at least, uh, at least um, uh, approximately. Okay, so it all sounds uh, really nice, but I just wanted to uh, not, I mean, to be realistic, I don't want to oversell anything. I mean, uh, quantum annealing has been known for more than 20 years, and people know that there are serious problems about it. Uh, one of them is the gap problem, so that uh, this adiabatic evolution is only um, uh, only works if the energy difference between your ground state and your first excited state is um, is uh, of a certain magnitude that you don't ex that when you do the sweep when you evolve your time you don't evolve too fast that you may transition into some excited state. Um, so so and this gap this energy difference will normally will be closing. And for in the worst cases, it will be closing exponentially um, for uh, bigger and bigger systems. Um, and then you also have the problem that you don't know actually the size of this gap and what it happens. So itself, this is an NP-hard problem. And then on top of that, there is the usual thermal noise and decoherence. And another, uh, another complication is that there is classical methods which are very efficient, like quantum Monte Carlo. So all of this is 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 known and it and it's it's uh, being dealt with. And in fact, there's a lot of so solutions that address part of these problems. Um, and and I'm just naming a few here, like reverse annealing, non-homogeneous annealing, um, and then also the introduction of the so-called non-stochastic terms, which, for instance. Um, they, they take this form. So this is the linear evolution I, I described before, but you may add another term that is zero at the beginning and at the end, but appears somewhere in the middle of your evolution. And this term somewhat takes you away in the hyperspace of parameters. It takes you away from this closing gap that I described, and you, you go through a different path to guiding, guiding the system into the final uh, Hamiltonian, for instance. So I'm just naming a few things, but Certainly, there is much more work needed, and, and we are definitely looking into it. OK, so this is just the introduction. Um, so now you know a little bit about analog quantum computing in case uh, you were not aware of it. Um, so now I'm going to switch and get a bit more technical. Uh, so there is many approaches. There's many physical pl platforms that um, are being proposed today and being implemented to build quantum processors, digital and analog. Um, the, the, the platform that I'm most familiar with is superconducting circuits, and so I'm going to describe them a bit more in detail. Uh, for those of you who are have not heard about superconducting circuits, or, or if you have and maybe not in detail, I just want to, to start by realizing um, some some facts about, about these systems. Um, in, um, in nature, we are usually told that the Schrodinger equation is applicable for the microscopic world, world of atoms and photons and molecules. Whereas for the macroscopic world, at least on our scale, we use Newton's law. And of course, for larger scale, we use relativity. But um, certainly, uh, we would not imagine applying Schrodinger's equation for uh, bigger systems. But turns out there is an intermediate regime known as meso the mesoscopic regime, in which you have uh, where this is where these superconducting devices live. Because they consist of actually large number of particles, they are superconductors, um, or they may actually be um, electrons in a two-dimensional electron gas. So, so they require um, some kind of like substrate, if you want, of, of, um, of a many body, uh, of, of the many body system. And then the excitations in this many body system represent the degrees of freedom of your, of your qubit. These are artificial, so we you don't find qubits out in the universe uh, spontaneously created. So they are made by by us, and um, and they consist of this collective degrees of freedom that I I described. So the the simplest case is the the harmonic oscillator. So this is simplest of the uh, quantum circuits you can think about, 
Harmonic oscillator is a capacitor and an inductor uh, attached together. Uh, this, uh, this circuit can be very well described by uh, such a Hamiltonian that mimics exactly the same uh, physics of the mechanical uh, harmonic oscillator if you replace charge by momentum and, and flux by the position. So the energy in the circuit, is, uh, it, it, it um, uh, oscillates between the inductor and the capacitor at the resonance frequency of the circuit, which we know very well. But now if you take the circuit and you cool it down, down to a temperature which is well below the, the frequency, sorry, I, I, I forgot an H bar here. I should, I should remember to put it back. Um, uh, so if you cool down your, your uh, system, then the probability that it gets excited will be very low. And then it's when the quantum effects of the circuit will start to appear. Um, at, at this point, you stop talking about these variables that are classical parameters, flux and charge, and they become uh, quantum operators with canonical, uh, with, with um, uh, 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 commutator relations. And each one of these operators actually uh, displays quantum fluctuations. Uh, for instance, the flux, uh, you can show that the flux uh, uh, exhibits these fluctuations for this for this harmonic oscillator. So when the temperature um, is very low, actually they depend entirely on the impedance of, of the circuit. And this kind of fluctuations is what, uh, yeah, what we call the quantum effects. And they're the basis of, um, of controlling the degrees of freedom um, of uh, quantum degrees of freedom of, of a circuit. So if you want more details, I strongly recommend you to take a look at this, uh, at this work by, by Professor Devore from, from Yale. Okay, but um, harmonic oscillators are not, are not good qubits because they are, they're, um, their eigenstates are equidistant. So we cannot really address an individual transition. So we have to do something to change that. And, and we actually, we replace the inductance in the circuit by a Josephson junction. So a Josephson junction, is a kind of a nonlinear dissipationless uh, circuit element. It, it, it only um, is possible in superconducting circuits because it relies on the fact that you have a macroscopic wave function, which is the one of the superconductor. And when you have two superconductors brought together, uh, but, but uh, separated by a very thin barrier, normally it's an insulating barrier, um, tunneling will take place. Tunneling of the wave function will take place and the overlap of the wave functions between both sides, the interference between uh, these two wave functions will produce current. And um, uh, Brian Josephson predicted this effect in the 1960s and uh, the energy that can be stored in a Josephson junction takes this form, takes the cosine of phi and phi is the phase drop, uh, the superconducting phase drop across the junction. So now you don't have, uh, going back, you don't have a quadratic term, you have a cosine. So this is a nonlinear non um, uh, operator. And uh, if you take this Hamiltonian and you diagonalize it, you will, you will obtain this uh, anharmonic spectrum. It's a cosine potential. So therefore the levels are not equidistant anymore. And then you can single out what, whatever pair you want, typically the lowest two. And this is what you call a qubit, the zero and, and your one. Um, so now you have uh, a system where you can actually directly address energy level transitions. And this is the circuit is known as a transmon qubit and is the is the workhorse for quantum computing uh, in 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 the most uh, um, uh, in most projects around the world, especially in in big companies like IBM or or Google. Um, if you want to do analog quantum computing, though, you cannot use uh, you cannot use transmons, and I will explain later why why that is the case. Um, but there is a different class of superconducting qubits that um, do not rely on on the same kind of physics uh, that I explained, but they rely on the fact that they live in a closed in a closed uh, superconducting loop. So this is the case that I'm showing here. This is the simplest uh, superconducting flux qubit. Historically, this is known as the radio, radio frequency squid or RF squid. And it consists of a single junction in a loop that there, the, where some flux is, is threading. So, so classically, due to the flux quantization or fluxoid quantization around the loop, 
uh, the current um, that flows in this in this ring will depend on the external flux. And so as the as the flux increases, there is this current uh, trying is trying to maintain the total number of of uh, fluxoids uh, constant up to a point where it will reach the critical current of this junction. And at that point, the current will uh, will uh, flip sign, and a different number of fluxoid will enter the ring. So there will be one more fluxoid entering, and so the current will flip sign to keep the total number of fluxoids constant. And then this this goes on and on. Um, th this is a classical picture. So, um, but you can see that at this jumping point, the classical uh, these these two states are classically uh, degenerate. So when you uh, turn on quantum mechanics, turns out that this will be um, actually is, uh, it will be in a superposition of these two currents. Uh, so electrically, the circuit looks like this: it's a jun junction shunted by an inductance, and the circuit can be described by a single parameter, this beta. That's the ratio between the inductance of the of the loop and the inductance produced by the junction. Um, the qubit. Uh, Appears, let's say the, the these qubit physics that I describe here, they appear when this beta is larger than one, which is equivalent to when you have um, the potential energy of this of the circuit that can be easily computed um, becomes a double well, double well potential at the precise flux where it's one half of, of a flux quantum in in the loop. And uh, this potential tells you that uh, each one of these two minima corresponds to uh, sorry this horizontal axis is the phase across the junction. So each one of the two minima corresponds to a finite phase across the junction. And a finite phase implies current. So one minimum corresponds to current in one direction and the op other minimum, which is the opposite phase, uh, is current in flowing in the opposite direction. But these two states, they're only separated by a barrier here. And in reality, because they are quantum states, they will, they will um, interact, they in interfere. And so the eigenstates of the system will become superposition states, like I was saying here. So that uh, now uh, when you are in this precise flux, that's when the two minima are degenerate. So the super the eigenstates of the system become superpositions of the of the two persistent current states, which is equivalent to say that at this at this crossing point, uh, this jumping point when current flip sign, that's where you you observe this um, this superposition. Um, this achieving this condition of the having a double well requires large inductance because the junctions typically have exhibit large inductances, and in the old days, this required large loops. And large loops means that you pick up a lot of flux noise. Um, so, in in some some years ago, uh, there was. Uh, proposal to replace this inductance by two Josephson junctions. And that that became known as the persistent current qubit or, or also a flux qubit or three junction flux qubit. And this was pioneered in, in Delft and in, and in MIT. So the circuit is a little bit more complicated. You have multiple junctions. So the Hamiltonian looks like this. You have two degrees of freedom, but anyway, you diagonalize this so the 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 potential is still double well in the half of flux quantum in the loop. And then you also have the same, this is exact diagonalization. You have these, uh, these Gaussians that correspond to the, to the eigenstage in each one of the two minima of this double well potential. So you, you have the exact same physics that I described in the previous circuit. The difference is that now the loop can be very, very tiny, just a few microns uh, across. Um, I should stress that um, in, in uh, modern times, people have developed, people in the field of superconducting qubits have developed uh, superinductors. So uh, the, the, it's possible now to produce inductances that, that are in the right range and they, they take up very tiny space. And in fact, there's already, um, there's already works of, of uh, flux qubits made with the superinductor that, that are much, much smaller than uh, the original RF squid. So here is um, what I motivate. Why do you need this kind of qubits? Um, so th this is the spectrum of the of the qubits. As uh, so, this is the energies of the system as a function of the external magnetic flux. And you you see that um, the two lowest states 
they become very close to each other at these precise flux where you have um, this this um, alpha flux quantum. This is known as the symmetry point or the sweet spot because it's also the place at which the qubit becomes to first order insensitive to flux because you see the, these energy bands become flat. And so uh, flux noise to first order is canceled at this point. So the coherence is maximum. Um, but uh, the slope of these energy bands is actually connected to the current that flows in the loop. So it's, it's actually the, the derivative. This is, if you wish, this is um, analogous to a crystal, uh, the group velocity of, of, um, uh, of the carriers in, in a crystal, which is the der derivative of the band. So it's, it's analogous to that. Um, so the ground state, for instance, uh, to the left and to the right of this symmetry point, the slope changes sign. So that means the current actually changes sign. The current in the ground state changes sign. So you have a property. This is some kind of like internal um, degree of freedom of the circuit that you can control by changing flux without changing the state of the qubit. And now think about a spin one half particle. So a spin one half particle has a magnetic moment. And when you bring this particle under a magnetic field, the, the spin Z, the Z component of the spin uh, magnetic moment will align to the magnetic field in the ground state. In the lowest energy state, the field in pointing up, the spin will align parallel to it. And if you excite the spin, it will be anti-parallel to the external field. Um, but actually, if you, uh, if you flip the sign of the magnetic field, then the spin will find the ground state to be uh, parallel to the magnetic field, but it will flip. So what you call the ground state of the spin will depend on the direction of the field. And this is exactly the same thing that is happening in the circuit. The circuit, the, the current flowing uh, on, on either side of the, of the symmetry point uh, will change sign depending on the value of this external flux. So this is equivalent to the, to the Zeeman energy. Um, so that means these flux qubits are good emulators of, of the physics of spin one half particles. And that is why they are uh, necessary because in these uh, analog quantum processors that I described, uh, what you're doing in the back, uh, so in the background is to simulate the, the Ising model. So a model of interacting spins. And therefore, if you have a, if you have a, um, a system, a quantum system that simulates the physics of uh, of spin one half particles, then you can in fact implement the Ising model in this in the same system. Um, so this is just um, an extra uh, say extra technical slide um, to to mention how we read out qubit states because I'm going to use this later on. Um, so just in case that so everyone is is uh, aware of this. Um, in order to read out qubit states, be uh, transmon qubit or flux qubit, um, how we do it is we couple the qubit. So in this case, it's shown in this picture. This is actually a, a transmon qubit um, with a with a linear resonator, which is this wiggly line here. This uh, this is called a transmission line uh, resonator, and um, it is capacity. In this case, it is capacitively coupled to the to the qubit. And this, this interaction between the two systems leads to like qubit resonator physics uh, that is captured in this so-called um, James Cummings model. So everything, if you have not heard about this, I recommend you this, this uh, old paper by the Yale group, which was the first one that proposed this idea to use resonators to read out qubit states and also to do other things. Um, so when the two systems, when resonator and qubit are not on resonance, uh, that means there is a difference between their energies, and this difference in energies is much larger than the interaction strength between them, then you can uh, describe the system, the physics of the system, uh, using a slightly modified Hamiltonian known as the dispersive Hamiltonian. Um, that takes this form shown here, um, where you have uh, a term that uh, uh, represents the resonator frequency that contains the original frequency of the resonator plus a shift that uh, usually is called the Stark shift or the AC Stark shift that depends on the qubit state. So by reading out 
or the by, sorry by measuring the frequency of your resonator you get a direct information on the qubit state and so because these um uh these uh two operators they um uh so the system here the two systems do not ex exchange any energy this process does not uh does not produce a strong effect a strong back action on the on the qubit so you can even like repeat the measurement um and then on the qubit part you have a shift that does not depend on on the resonator the resonator uh photon number and this is related to the vacuum fluctuations in the resonator and is known as the lamp shift but it's just a constant constant shift so um so this is the the common way to do that so but to measure qubit uh states is by looking at the resonance frequency of this linear resonator okay so um just uh, just to terminate this part on general description of qubits i wanted to to draw attention to uh the 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 how this how this field has been evolving over time i took this this image from from this review from the MIT group, um, the the field of superconducting qubits started uh, more than twenty years ago um, by initial prototypes that were very noisy because they they were uh, encoding their quantum states in 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 physical states of the circuit that were very sensitive to noise, particularly charged noise, and the lifetimes of those circuits was in the nanosecond scale. So as people learned to encode the quantum states in more protected uh, circuits, the, the relaxation and coherence times increased. And, and so this is not a straight line, it's more like a ladder, it has like steps. So every step is a discovery of a new type of qubit that, um, that preserves coherent better, coherence better than the previous qubits. And, uh, and uh, over the years, this has gone up and uh, a few years ago, the, the millisecond bar was already exceeded with uh, with fluxonium qubits and also 3D transmon qubits. And by now, people are encoding um, quantum states uh, in, in cavities, actually in three-dimensional cavities using qubits. So this is even more robust. It's more difficult to scale, but at the single qubit level, the, um, the states are already somewhat protected. Uh, so, so it's it's a trend that keeps keeps going up, and uh, this is to compare with the other with the other physical platforms, where uh, people are trying to build uh, these quantum processors, and so it's the, the the individual quality of of the qubits is a very important uh, factor, and in this technology, this this just keeps going up. There's so far there is no barrier. But it's not. I mean, it's not. Um, it's not a trivial task. It still requires a lot of effort to push forward these uh, these limits. Uh, but in order to reach this error correction um, that I mentioned in the beginning, it is necessary to keep to keep pushing the numbers as as years years go by. Okay, so that's let's say enough of the background. Uh, let's say background explanation, background introduction of these qubits. What I'm going to show next is the uh, results we've we've been obtaining of, with small prototypes uh, here in, in Barcelona. So first, I'm going to describe the progress that we've made uh, within the context of the Abacus project. This is a FETOPEN uh, project that is um, coordinated by my group at IFI, where we are developing these uh, coherent flux qubits for for um, uh, analog uh, analog quantum computing uh, applications. And this here is one of the uh, first working prototypes. Um, you see again, this wiggly line, this is our readout resonator, and this is like our measurement line. And here in the center is where we have the qubit. There is this line coming from the bottom. This is a flux line, local flux line. If we zoom into this middle part, here we have the qubit. So the qubit is actually this diamond shape, and at every corner, there is a junction. And then we can flux bias the qubit, and the qubit is coupled to this path. Here, this actually is representing the um, the capacitor that we use to shunt this qubit for for technical reasons that I don't have time to explain. Uh, so this whole uh, device is made. Actually, this was made in, not in our own uh, 
facilities, but this was made in, in London, in the Royal Holloway University, uh, through a collaboration with Abacus, and is made with uh, e-beam and liftoff uh, process, so it's very standard in the, in the field. It's the same kind of process that is used to produce uh, high quality transmont qubits for, for digital uh, quantum computation. So the quality of these qubits is essentially comparable. Um, this uh, this is measurements data that of, of one of the of the first batches that 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 we obtained. We've gone through several rounds, and uh, now that we are obtaining like um, a considerably better results than than in the in the first uh, rounds. So this is the spectrum of the resonator. So this is the frequency of the resonator as we scan the uh, external coil when we switch the magnetic field. Uh, at some point, we find this pattern of two avoided level crossings that are symmetric with each other with respect to some central point. So this is the um, this is the signature of uh, interaction between the qubit and the resonator. So the fact that you have this avoided level crossing. In this case, is the splitting is about two, two megahertz. Um, so once we obtain this, this pattern, what we do is we apply, we fix our um, probing signal to the resonator frequency. And then we send a second tone that were, that we use to scan the frequency to look for the qubit frequency. And once we hit the qubit frequency, the qubit flips its state. And because of the physics that I explained from this uh, AC Stark Hamiltonian, uh, the resonator frequency shifts. So now our probing signal is not probing the resonator on resonance. So the signal will be will be reflected. And, and using this signature, then we can map out the qubit spectrum. So for this device, this is how, how it looks like. It, it, uh, this is a typical flux qubit spectrum. It's a hyperbola. It has a minimum energy splitting. And then it has a range where it displays a linear, a linear dependence uh, with, with flux. So this particular device was um, not ideal yet. So the energy splitting was quite low uh, on the order of 300 megahertz. And the slope was in the range of 60 to 65 nanoamps, which is more or less what, what we targeted. And uh, so, despite not being um, uh, in the best um, in the best parameter space, uh, we, we still managed to coherently control this qubit. So this is an example of uh, so-called Ramsey fringes. So this is a measurement to obtain the the coherence time of this qubit. Um, this uh, for this device because of the small gap, these measurements were made quite far away from this sweet spot where, as I explained earlier. It's where you would expect the the longest um, coherence time. So these Ramsey oscillations they don't have they don't live for too long order order 100 nanoseconds. But then the T1 times the relaxation times they are uh, they are much better. They're in the range of tens of microseconds, um, and this is as a function of um, uh, the distance to this to this to this symmetry point. So. There is some kind of like intermediate maximum when you go too high in in frequency, you start to approach the resonator frequency, and then uh, you get per cell per cell limitation. And if you go to too low too low energy splitting, then you start to see um, thermal effects and uh, other type of noise, more like uh, charged noise. Um, but nevertheless, this qubit uh, showed uh, good good prospects despite the fact that it was too low in frequency, even to control. So we could not even control it at the lowest frequency. So now we are going through a new run uh, that uh, should should display better better numbers. Um, in parallel, and this is done in Kilimanjaro uh, through another European funded project, the rocket, EIC transition rocket. We're actually scaling up the, the qubit number. And this is one of our very early prototypes where we have uh, one, flux qubits on the left, one flux qubit on the right, and then we couple them through a radio frequency squid. So this is a standard type of coupling circuit. And then we uh, we use readout resonators on each qubit and local flux control. So this is one of the uh, early prototypes we started probing uh, where we have been already been able to control the qubits uh, individually um, uh, by essentially doing, I mean, this, this uh, schematic here represents the compensation of crosstalk signals uh, from these from these lines. So now we are in the process of uh, tuning up this device for 
for more interesting um, applications. So this is more or less where we stand in the in terms of uh, analog quantum computing on the let's say on the academic side. Um, and now I wanted to use uh, the last minutes of this presentation to tell you a little bit about uh, what we have been doing on the digital side of things, which is to install the first uh, quantum processing unit uh, in Spain through the Quantum Spain project at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So these these devices they have been um, they have been produced by uh, third parties, but uh, we have integrated them, tuned them up, tuned them up, and calibrated, and so far hosted them uh, for for this for this project. Um, so this gives me uh, the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what you need to uh, to run these qubits. You need this uh, what you see in this image in the center. <clears throat> this is known as a dilution refrigerator. So it's it's a cryostat that cools down to um, very very low temperature. Of a, of a few millikelvin, typically 10 to 15 millikelvin, and uh, on the on this uh, lowest uh, lowest plate. So anything you attach to this lowest plate will get cooled to this temperature. And because our qubits, um, I didn't explain it, but the energy differences they are in the microwave regime. So this is in the gigahertz. If you want to cool down your uh, circuit to its ground state, you need to be well below the equivalent of this millikelvins, uh, sorry, of this of this gigahertz, which corresponds to the few millikelvin regime. Um, so you see, besides these plates, uh, you need to guide your signals to control your, your qubits. And this you do with these uh, cables that, that loop and wiggle. And so these are coaxial cables. These are like high bandwidth cables where you can actually send signals to control your qubits. But on top of that, we are also starting to use more, let's say, more modern uh, technology that has been developed for controlling qubits. This is this strip you see in the back. This is actually produced by a startup in DAF known as DAF Circuits. And uh, it consists of actually waveguides that are patterned on this strip. And so it has as much, you can see it, in this space here, they have put eight lines, which is, uh, which is the same as this Wiggly lines here, so you just compare the the, the footprint uh, between the two technologies. So this this um, highly dense um, uh, wiring, flexible wiring, is is going to be the future for scaling up the the, the qubit number. Because actually, one of the big bottlenecks um, of scaling qubit numbers is how many cables you can put in your fridge. So this sounds um, sounds silly, but it is actually a real limitation. So going going for these kind of technologies is, is a step forward in, in scaling up. So this dilution refrigerator is actually hosted in the Institute for High Energy Physics. So this is where the IFI quantum computing lab is, is, uh, is, uh, is based. And so Kilimanjaro has also uh, uh, bridges in the, in the same space, in the sh same shared space. And one of them is where we have the Quantum Spain uh, project. So this is a, an actual image of, of this first uh, device uh, within Quantum Spain. So it's actually hosted inside of this can. This can is made of um, magnetic um, uh, screening material. And so it, it shields from background magnetic fields, in particular, the field of the earth, but also like background fields. And then uh, you see in this, at the bottom, there is a lot of, uh, Cylinders, these are actually filters. So this filter noise coming from higher temperature stages. So every single line that goes into this can and it connects to the qubit is, is protected because the, these qubits are extremely fragile. So you need to you need to implement any measure to limit the coherence time to, to maximize the coherence time of, of your qubits. And so then once you um once you have everything connected, uh, you you um bring this, this cryostat into operation by, by closing uh, multi, multi, multiple layers of, of um, radiation shielding on each temperature stage. And this is used to keep the system cold and avoid uh, radiation from uh, room temperature to heat up, heat up the system. So this is standard in dilution refrigerators. And so finally, a little bit about the chip itself. So the chip is uh, actually is produced by a, star a startup company in Delft, uh, Quanware. Uh, they 
they branded it as, as a Soprano. This, this is their first uh, uh, type, this, their, their first product. So it's, it's five qubits in a star configuration. So um, every qubit talks to the central one. And then each qubit has its own individual readout resonator. And all of them are coupled to a feed line that is used to um, uh, talk to each one resonator individually. Um, each, each one of the qubits, each one of these balls looks like this. So it's a transform qubit that I explained a few slides ago. Uh, so it's a junction in parallel with the capacitor, but actually um, these qubits are double uh, junctions. So this is known as a squid. So this is, if you if you think back at the idea of an uh, unharmonic oscillator, this uh, squid allows you to tune the inductance, the effective inductance of this resonator. So you can actually tune the energy uh, of the qubit uh, with, with external flux. And then on top of that, you can control uh, the qubit state by either applying um, uh, voltage um, uh, voltage pulses to to the to the qubit or flux pulses when you want to sweep the qubit frequency and that is used to implement two qubit gates that I'll show in a moment. So once you uh, have this chip, you cool it down. Um, then you you actually need to measure the qubit state. So this is again a schematic um, of these five qubits. Then you have to, um, if you want high uh, visibility of your signal, you want to amplify it, but not by any type of amplifier, but by a very special type known as quantum, li quantum limited amplifiers that almost add no noise to this on top of your signal. Uh, they basically add the minimum amount of noise allowed by quantum mechanics. There's some fundamental uh, limits on, on the amplification of of uh, linear amplifiers. And uh, these kind of amplifiers are implemented in so-called traveling wave parametric amplifier um, uh, configurations. They are also superconducting circuits. They are arrays of junctions, actually arrays of Jodeson junctions. And the one we use actually is made by silent waves, which is the startup from Grenoble in, in France. Um, so once you have all this setup ready, then you cool it down and then you do um, what's called a spectroscopy uh, characterization. So you um, you use this for, for every single qubit, you do the same. So you um, you apply a magnetic flux and uh, you read out your resonator frequency and then you apply this second tone that you scan to look for uh, when it resonates with, with your qubit. And then you keep tuning your flux and you follow this resonance and, and that's what you, you see. There is this um, inverted kind of like parabola uh, and that's the resonance frequency of the qubit. So for this particular one, the qubit frequency is like 6.7 gigahertz, and then it can be tuned down to um, about 500 megahertz um, um, modulation. So this uh, we would call a working device. So this one can be is tunable with with uh, with flux. And the next is to characterize its its coherence. So then we apply um, uh, we fix, for instance, at this at this top frequency uh, where uh, the qubit is insensitive to flux to first order. So we drive pulses uh, to this uh, precise frequency. And then uh, by tuning the amplitude of the pulses for a fixed duration, we observe the, the signal coming out of the, of the resonator to be oscillating as a function of the amplitude. And, and so this is, a, this is a signature of so-called Rabi oscillations in which uh, for this amplitude, you flip the qubit state. And if you keep increasing the amplitude, the qubit state will completely go back to the ground state. And then it will keep going in, in oscillations. So if you actually stop at this amplitude, then you flip the qubit state completely. And this is known as a, as a pipe pulse. So all the information I'm giving you is especially directed to users of these devices. And others from IBM, for instance, they're, they're, they're similar to this. Um, because this kind of data is not what you get uh, normally. So I think this is complementing the knowledge you may have from these chips. And the next that you can do is to um, um, measure how, how, how long these qubits live by applying a, a, a sequence of pulses. So you first apply a pi pulse, you wait, and then you, you do readout. So you wait until the qubit relaxes and this decay uh, gives you an idea of the lifetime. And for this particular qubit, this was almost 40 microseconds, which is, is pretty good. Um, then there is the readout. So you, you want to know 
how well you can distinguish these two these two states and this you do by applying single single shots so you you build a histogram in a two-dimensional histogram like i'm showing on the right and every blob corresponds to one of the two qubit states and uh, and uh, the radius of this blob gives you an idea of the noise uh, that's that's in your signal and then how far these two blobs separate this is the contrast of your readout and when you have this quantum limited amplifier, you get an, a boost in the signal to noise to discriminate between these two histograms. Mm -hmm. So then when you integrate the, the, these two in, in, in one of the axes, then you get, you get the, these histograms on the left. So you can see that for, for the ground state, uh, when, you, when, you're, let's say, when you're preparing the system in the ground state, there's a probability that the system gets excited. So this is known as thermal population. And, and this is this is normal. This is uh, expected. Um, it's very difficult to thermalize very well superconducting qubits because at very low temperatures, um, uh, it's it's very difficult to screen all the possible types of noise. So any tiny bit of noise will heat up your qubit. And then the opposite, when you're preparing your system in one, it's possible that you find it in the ground state. And this is just relaxation during the readout. So if you want to minimize this, you either read out faster or you improve um, the, the relaxation time. And, um, and then uh, with, with these kind of histograms, then you can build these curves that, that quantify the, the difference between the maximum difference in which you can discriminate the two states. So, so this gives you this fidelity of the readout, which is about 89% for this particular instance. So this is one of the metrics that is used um, to characterize this this kind of uh, this kind of chips, and then to couple the qubits in this in this particular device, these straight lines, this actually uh, is made with capacitors. So the qubits are attached to each other by by capacitance, and uh, this capacitance provides uh, uh, some kind of like exchange energy between the qubits, and by pulsing the frequency of one qubit close to the other and then bring it back, you can do um, uh, control phase operations. And then you can do uh, this conditional phase experiment where you, you start with the superposition and then you, you find the target probability as a function of the phase in the superposition in this, in this um, uh, two qubit gate. So this is the kind of two qubit gates that, uh, one, of, one kind of two qubit gates that can be used, that can be implemented in this system. And it's the one that is used actually when you run the chip, uh, when you uh, run algorithms on this, on this chip. Um, okay, I'm almost done. So the the roadmap of this QPU, so this is actually from what it looks like right now from the outside. So this is the uh, the first quantum processor that is online in Spain. So the, the plan is to move move the chip and the future chips to the to the Barcelona supercomputing premises once they have uh, made their space uh, ready. Uh, in the meantime, the chip will keep being keep being hosted in EFI, and uh, and it will be uh, controlled by by and, and tuned up by the Kilimanjaro team. And so we are actually uh, very busy preparing the next uh, the next batch of of chips, all the way to the final one that is expected in uh, next year. That will be a 30, 30 qubit chip, and there's a new cryostat that is being uh, prepared to to test to test that kind of chip. Okay, so I'm at the end of my talk. Uh, so I'm just to summarize, I've uh, mentioned uh, that superconducting circuits are leading candidates to build both digital and analog quantum processors. And uh, this near term advantage is more likely today with analog quantum processors than with, with digital ones without error correction. And uh, these flux qubits, as I mentioned, are necessary ele elements to build is analog quantum processors. You cannot build them with, with transmog qubits. And uh, finally, I've shown you a little bit about how this uh, first quantum processor in Spain works, this five qubit QPU delivered by Kilimanjaro that is operated in the IFI premises for the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and thank the IFI team and the Kilimanjaro uh, team for, for their efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was a really nice and a really inspiring talk. Um, I'm sure there are there are questions around, so please uh, open your 
microphone and uh, make questions. Oh, hi, I do have a question. Hello, Marta. Hi. Um, well, first of all, congratulations for the very nice talk and for the cool results. And thanks. Thank you for telling us about it. I have a question about the um, uh, about the flux qubit. You showed us a uh, two-tone spectroscopy of the uh, qubit transition and also some coherence times. And in yes. both, um, well, in the spectroscopy, you see that it has flux. It somehow a bit more broadened, or it looks even like a double line also, and this agrees with the T1 times that you in the next slide going a bit, mm -hmm. dropping a bit at close to half flux. What do you think that is? Because that should be the flux sweet spot, right? So I think you mentioned charge noise and temperature, but I'm not sure exactly how this would. These are the main reasons why you think you're seeing uh, these lower coherence times there? Or? Um, well, so um, if it would only be flux noise, yeah, you would expect to have T1 be a minimum in this in this sweet spot. Um, so if you were if, if this device was T1 limited, then the line width would be narrowest. Uh, sorry, it would be broader at the at this point. Normally, in flux qubits, as you move away from the symmetry point, you have the flux noise, the one over f, that that is the dominant one up here. Um, the fact that this is broadening broadening here, it probably indicates that we have either some kind of like uh, charge charge based noise or quasi-particle noise, because even though flux qubit should be, I mean, it's they are in the same kind of parameter regime as the transmond, so they should be more insensitive to charges, but not not fully. And, and you also have the electric noise that could also affect you, which is also related to the, the, the electric dipole of the qubit, but flux qubits also have an electric dipole. So, um, but here it's also, yeah, the temperature is definitely, uh, um, potential potential um, cause of this of this broadening it's it's too low this gap is too low yeah okay I see. thanks um, <clears throat> yeah I don't know if there was another question otherwise I have a second yeah. one yeah so my other question was more well I'm not a super expert in flux qubits but why are them the main or what are the advantages of flux qubits for this um, analog simulation and applications compared to other superconducting qubits? You mentioned a couple of times that transmons are not the best uh, alternative, but how would they compare to flexoniums, for example, or some other alternatives? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question because I have not uh, have time to mention this. Um, in, in, in these analog processes, um, everything everything has to do with the interactions between qubits. So you actually, you want your, your um, Hamiltonian to be dominated by the interactions. And that means the interaction energy scale has to be um, comparable to the uh, excitation energies of the qubits. So coupling flux qubits uh, to, so obtaining uh, interaction energies between flux qubits uh, of this range is possible. With fluxoniums, I think it's very hard, at least inductively, because the persistent current is super low. And uh, I have thought about it. I, I'm not an expert on fluxoniums, but I think it's going to be very hard to obtain uh, these kind of couplings with fluxonium qubits, at least inductive. Capacitive, maybe you can push it, but I'm not sure that's that's easy either. So uh, for now, I don't see how you can use fluxonium qubits for, for these uh, analog uh, uh, applications. Yeah. OK, I see. Yeah. Yeah, so it's mainly the type of couple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Marta. Is uh, there anybody else? Please jump to the stage. No more questions. So then I I I have one which maybe is uh, a bit uh, well. So uh, we 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 would like to know uh, <clears throat> the qubit that you're you're building for this for quantum plane. How does it compare to the other qubits that are around? Uh, I mean the the ones that uh, the IBM qubits. So they are they better? Are they? Um, so you mean the ones in the chip? This this chip that we yeah have. exactly. Yeah. Or the ones you have are planning. I mean. Um, in, in terms of quality, uh, they are they are 
they're good. They're they're like, um, I would say state of the art given, given the kind of materials used, given the the geometries used. Uh, if you compare it to I IBM, the IBM qubits they are different. Uh, they actually don't have this flux tunability. They are fixed frequency qubits. So if you yeah. remove this flux tunability, you also remove the sensitivity to flux noise. So the mm -hmm. IBM qubits naturally are much longer lived, but then they have a problem to couple. The two qubit mm -hmm. gates from IBM, because the, the frequencies are fixed, they have to use like um, external drives to induce, um, uh, let's say second order processes that that in the end they implement like some kind of like two qubit gate, but they're very slow. There, there's the, the cost. There's I mean there's a cost. Uh -huh. if you have a insensitive qubit, then it will be harder to couple to other qubits. And so the two qubit gates from IBM are are uh, very slow. In comparison, this this kind of uh, qubits allow these two qubit gates to be uh, even faster than the single qubit gates or or comparable. Wow. So wow. they're in the order like 20, 30 nanoseconds. Um, I'm I'm not up to date on the two, let's say the time of the two qubit gate for IBM, but I believe this is a few times slower. Yeah, okay, okay. That's, that's one of the main differences with, with the IBM. So actually these type of qubits are um, very similar to the ones made by Google, at least the the the, mm -hmm. the, the devices that Google has published uh, from yeah. which they results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the upcoming okay. chips, the the qubits themselves will look similar. The topology yeah. will be quite different because as you add more qubits, then the network becomes more more complicated. But it's mm, yeah, it's kind of like a two D grid mm, approximately. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. So, my other question was already asked by Marta. So, I'm uh, satisfied, and I think we are already five minutes over time. It was altogether very nice, a very nice talk, very interesting talk. We thank you, Paul, for this time. And uh, we <clears throat> announced that uh, next next uh, week we will have uh, uh, another talk on digital analog computing, but, probably, uh, but uh, certainly it's not the same thing. The, the words are the same, but uh, 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 it's, it's a different talk. So please stay tuned and uh, we hope to have you have you back in in one week uh, at the same time. So thank you very much, and uh, thanks, Paul, and uh, goodbye, everybody. Have a nice evening. Thanks for inviting. Thank you. Yeah. Ciao.